dude, I'm excited to chat with you about selling from the heart because it's something that I totally believe in 1000%. I think it's probably the biggest game changer for like how anyone should sell. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to dive in. Thanks for taking the time. No, you're welcome. So, so here's the, here's a big question. Why do you think it's so difficult? And, and, and I'll, and I'll tell you why it, it, it's, it's interesting. Can I, I'm going to set this up with, because as I was writing the book, yeah, uh, I was pro I started writing it last November. Okay. And, and it really stemmed from the podcast. Right. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you've probably seen selling from the heart podcast. I do a Daryl. Yeah. So it, it was probably a year and a half ago is April. And, and I told, we were sitting in a hotel room. I was getting ready to speak at a technology event in Vegas. And I said, Hey, Daryl, you want to start a podcast? And he goes, sure. He goes, you know, neither one of us even knew anything about podcasting, Brandon. Oh, he of goes, course. He goes, what do you want to call it? And I said, exactly how I sold selling from the heart. And that's how it, that's how the whole thing stemmed up. Wow. And we started podcasting and, and then he talked me into writing a book. He kind of hijacked me because I live in LA and he lives in Little Rock. So he had me fly. Dude, this is hilarious, but it's a long story, but it leads into why people don't sell from the heart. Yeah. So, I want to hear it. So I'm in LA and every year, so he lives in Little Rock. So he lives about a half an hour from the Ozark mountains. Oh, so, wow. Like so, uh, there's a movie about uh, the show about that. Um, Ozark, I think it's called on Netflix. It's a good show. Yeah. The so every year, account. every year in August, I fly out to his place. Well, I see him all the time, but I fly out to his house, stay there, and then we drive up to his cabin in the Ozarks because the Amazing. phones don't work, nothing works, and it just gives us time to talk. And so that was what our plan was. And I'm flying from LA to Houston to Little Rock, and I get to Houston, my phone blows up, and he goes, "Hey, change of plans, but I can't tell you until you get to Little Rock." I said, cool, fine, whatever. So he picks me up at the airport, throws my bag in the car, locks the doors, and he goes, we're not going to the Ozarks. I go, where are we going? He goes, Austin, Texas. I said, you're a fucking idiot. I was just in Houston. Why couldn't you tell me that? And I could have rerouted from Houston to Austin, and you could have just met me there. And he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, here's the deal. You got so much knowledge in your head. You got to freaking write a book. And from Little Rock to Dallas, he convinced me to write Selling from the Heart last August. Wow. And so was it a hard sell for you? Like, because you guys were already doing the podcast. You probably wanted to write a book. Was it hard, uh, like a hard sell? Yeah, you know what, Brandon? I made a promise to my wife when we got married a gazillion years ago that I wanted to write a book by the time I was 50. And, you know, I just turned 54 last week. And so oh, wow. Congrats, man. Thanks. Can't so now my book. I thought you were 31. Yeah, right. Fuck. Yeah, right. Come on. But anyway, so she, I already promised her I was going to write a book. And I just never did, right? It was just those things. Just like some yeah. of the stuff you do, right? And I know you're goal-oriented and you're highly motivated. It's just, some, it's just one of the tick marks I can never tick off. Yeah, it's, it's a you know, hard one to tick off. It's and, you know, you're – off. It is the hardest one to tick off. And I mean, you know, cause you're, you know, you're assembling your book right now. So one of the things I said, Daryl, I said, I don't mind writing my book, but I know what'll happen a year from now. If I don't have somebody help me write this book, I'll never write the book. Yeah. So I researched the ghostwriter and awesome. I found, you know, somebody who lined to me, somebody who had to really know me and I interviewed a shit ton of them. I oh, wow. You know, I even talked to Keenan about it and, you know, he gave me some tips and so forth. And then finally I found somebody in Canada, believe it or not, who just, we just gelled. I mean, it's like peanut butter and jelly, right? Wow. And, How many ghostwriters did you interview? Five. Okay. Because after a while it just becomes a clusterfuck. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and I finally found somebody who understood who I was, who actually had been following me, read my blogs, kind of understood who I was. But you know what the best thing was? Is she goes, I'll only work with you under one condition. Dude, this is honest to God, true story. And I go, what's that? And she goes, you can't swear. Uh, that's a tough one for me. Well, it's a tough one for me too. But, <laughs> but I did it. But I did it the whole time. I mean, until the very end when it, when it was done, then I dropped a shit bomb on her because it was already done, right? That's awesome. But I mean, that, I mean, that's what I did. So I started writing the book. And as I started writing the book, I was dripping out. You saw it. I know you did. I was dripping oh. out because I had the cover done. Dude, it was, and I was awesome. Dripping, 
Thank you. I was just dripping out. Hey, in chapter one, you're going to learn this, right? In chapter two, you're going to learn this. Little quotes, drive people to a landing page, get a bunch of people signed up for the book, right? Build a database. All kind that. Of like copying you and everyone else. Like just, I just learn from you guys and then I just take action on it. And so um, there's, a, there's a story behind this because it wasn't until the book was done and I started talking to Jeb and Mike and Mark who read my book, you know, and Anthony before anyone else did is about February of this year, there's a, I, I can't tell you the guy's name now, but um, in February, he reaches out to me and he goes, I want to know the science behind your book. He goes, because selling from the heart, how your authentic self sells you speaks to me. He goes, I want to know the research. I want to know your case studies. I want to know what you're bringing to this book. And I said, listen, dude. I mean, because he asked me to connect. And I never even, I've, I've never said, even though I talk to him now all the time, he's like, we're tight. But back then I didn't know who he was. And he goes, I told him, I said, Hey, listen, I have no PhD in psychology. I got no PhD in human behavior. No, nothing. I got a PhD of getting this shit kicked out of me selling copiers in downtown Los Angeles. Yeah, so I'm bringing my street level approach to selling from the heart. I said, you're either going to like my book or you're not right. So be it. We're going to connect, right? We'll be online buddies, whatever. No big deal. And Brandon, I never talked to the guy again. This is in February. And he emailed me a couple times back and forth. He goes, the closest book I read to authenticity was Jeb Blunt, Sales EQ. And he goes, but he missed the mark a little bit. And I've told Jeb about that. And that was the last I talked to him. And then two weeks ago, he guy must have been following me on Twitter because he started tweeting out parts of my book. And I go, there's no way that guy can tweet that out without being deep into my book. Cause you could download the first three chapters of my book off my website for free, just cause it goes into HubSpot and I'm building up a database of people to download my book and all that. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so I go, cool. I go, I think I, you know, the guy's bought in and he comments something on LinkedIn and then he sends me a message. He goes, here's my cell phone number. Can you please call me? And I go, fine, whatever. So yeah. the, guy lives in Salt, the guy lives in Salt Lake City. And he, uh, I call him. He goes, I've been dying to talk to you. And I go, why? And he goes, you've written the single best book I've ever read on authenticity, ever, that has simplified emotional intelligence. Because that's one of the things that I didn't want to get clumped into, Brandon, when I was writing the book. Because, you know, to me, EI is too complicated. And I, I'm, yeah, I'm, it's complicated. I, I'm complicated. just a stupid, I'm just a stupid sales guy. And I like to keep things really simple yep. because I always said my dad, and it's in my book, my dad was a rocket scientist for the U S air force. So we That's moved insane. around my dad. We moved around all the time. And I could, if I asked my dad what one plus one is in an hour, he would still be telling me what one plus one is. And I go, when I wrote the book, I wanted to bring it down to the average salesperson in the average part of the United States can understand what authenticity meant that can relate to it. And he goes, you've hit the ball out of the ballpark with your book. And he goes, I'm not just saying this to kiss your ass. He wow. goes, I've written the best book on emotional intelligence that simplifies. Dude, that's and, amazing. But, but I, you know, and that's why, sorry, I took a lot as long story short or long story, even longer. Not, I love listening to it. It's but, good. Like, don't but, the whole, but, the whole, but the whole thing is this whole selling from the heart is I learned something about myself along the way. And you're going to learn something as you piece your book together about yourself. Yep. Is he gave me one word. He goes, as you finish writing your book, I want you to look up a word and it's called self deception. Okay. And, he, and I go, okay. And he goes, listen, he go, and you see, I throw it out there pretty hard, Brandon. I know you see it. Yep. And I do it for a reason because I care about the art of sales just like you do. Yep. Is there's too many schmucks out there that are running around talking about authenticity and yep. being real and being genuine who aren't, but they're portraying themselves to be. And he goes, that's self-deceiving. In fact, my buddy, Scott McGregor, You've probably seen scroll. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, right. Standing, Standing up. up. Yeah. yeah. So I wrote a chapter in his book and he wrote something in mine, but he, I'm, Scott and I are pretty tight. He goes, they're authentic douchebags, right? That's what he I got to interview him. I totally forgot. Um, I connected dude, with him. I got to interview him. And then dude, I. McGregor's a rock star, dude. I'll McGregor, write that down. Yeah. 
Dude, that guy's highly connected to some kingpins out there. He knows a shit ton of people. Yeah, I'll write that down real quick. Keep going though. I'm listening. So, but but you know that that's the that's the thing, and is now is I walked I walked away from a sale just three days ago. I, I told I told an owner of a company, and they're about a fifty sixty million dollar company, not bad with a sales team. I was yep. just out there three weeks ago. I said I can't continue cashing your checks. I just can't do it. Just because. Uh... What, I, said, I'm being, I, I just told the guy, I said, I'm being transparent. I'm being, being completely honest and I'm speaking from my heart. I said, it would go against my grain if I continued cash in any of your checks because your sales team's not buying into it. And there'll be sales coaches and trainers, or however you want to call it out there that will cash your checks. But if I can't get complete buy-in, it's a waste of time. And I'm just being brutally honest with you. Got it. So it was hard for them to just buy into the strategy and the approach and the framework. Yeah. And I said, you know, it would go against who I was if, if I continue, I couldn't sleep at night. If I cashed your, any more of your checks, I couldn't do it. Wow. That's incredible. That's, that, that, that's being heartfelt. And that's, that's where a lot of people in the sales world don't get it. Yeah. Is they want to be true. They want to be genuine. They want to be authentic. They want to be the real deal. They say the words, but it rolls <laughs> off their mouth. Like I say, Hey Brandon, how's it going? Right. Like you don't they give don't, a fuck. The, yeah, I mean, they could give a fuck, but they can give a fuck until they get, you know, commissions in their wallet, then they don't give a fuck anymore. Yeah. That's the crazy part about what we had going on uh, with the reality TV show and vlog. It's like, dude, we, we, I don't have time like to, to, to not be authentic with how we do things. Yeah. So like, I, I love the, just being, just being authentic, even if I piss a lot of people off. And, um, dude, like the vlog and the reality TV show kind of forces us to just like, like you see everything every hour. So like we are us and you're going to love it and learn a lot <clears throat> or you're not. And that's just who we are. And we believe if we're in our mission of trying to positively impact a billion people, trying to help people maximize their wealth, health, and potential, anything that we do, like, you know, aligns with that mission, we're going to do it. And, kind of be us along the whole way. And, and I think you have to, because especially I, I always tell salespeople, you're already behind the eight ball already. I don't care how good you think you are. Oh yeah. Because they know you're a salesperson, right? They know you're a sales. The minute you, the minute you say you're a salesperson, you could be the most lost some credibility yep. instantaneously. And I would say, you know what? People can smell sincerity a mile away and they can smell insincerity a mile away. Yep. And they know when they're talking to the real deal or when they're talking to an empty suit that I promote like, like there's no tomorrow because there's so many empty suits. And I just like bringing to the sales world real world stories that people can relate to yeah. because they've all been there. Everyone's been an empty suit. I've been an empty suit before and so have you. But it's yep. – it's, we got to realize it and we got to realize that we can do a lot better. And to me, the key missing ingredient in this whole thing is your heart. That is the freaking single missing ingredient for salespeople is their heart. And, and would you say, you know, this is, would you say that's the sales secret? It was a sales secret for me, dude. You know, like, like, a, and by the way, to our audience, like this is totally not the normal, uh, <laughs> The, the normal way that we do this episode, but I want to, I don't want to interrupt it because it's so authentic. Like, you know, the heart you're saying, Larry's missing, it's missing the heart. So would you say that's the, the, your top sales secret? If you could go back to the beginning when you first started selling, you know, is, is the heart with that, like, what's your top sales secret for the audience? It, it's a heart. See, I started selling in 1988. So I graduated college December, 1987. Wow. And I grew up, you know, in a household where homework is rammed down your throat, right? And things like that. And it's just the era that my parents grew up in. And my dad, you know, like I said my dad was a rocket scientist for the U.S. Air Force. The guy had a PhD. From, <laughs> Dude, that's insane. Oh my from, gosh. From, he, from NYU and Cornell. And at 20 years old, the guy's got a PhD in astrophysics or something, something like that. But he did liquid jet propulsion for the U.S. Air Force. And I had to grow up with that, with my dad hovering. And I was, 
Do you remember that movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High? I, I don't think I saw it, but tell, tell yeah. me real quick. So it, it was this, you know, it's an old, you know, pot smoking movie, you know, okay. in the early 80s, high school thing. Just YouTube it. But yeah, um, I was Jeff Spicoli in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I hated school. So I graduated high school in 1982. So I just barely got by high school. I only went to college to appease my parents mm-hmm. just to get that college degree. And where my dad's book smart and is extremely book smart, I'm street smart. And I loved building relationships and all that. I just love, you can tell just like you are, you're an extrovert, right? Oh, yeah. I'm, my dad's an introvert. I'm the, a massive extrovert. And I just, all I wanted to do is get into sales because I just love talking to people. That? Did he, and he hate hated it? And see, and it. nothing, nothing worse. So I double majored. I have a degree in health science and I have a degree in marketing because okay. I wanted to be a pharmaceutical sales rep. That's what I wanted to do. Okay, interesting. But I could, Why but I pharma? Could. Was there a reason for pharma? Yeah, because I worked in a pharmacy when I was in high school. Not, nothing worse. Okay, dude. So nothing worse than you know. We've already swore in here, so it's no big deal. So yeah, yeah. It's nothing worse than a pot smoking kid in high school working in a pharmacy. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> but, oh my gosh. But I mean, that's what I did. And I kind of just saw the whole pharmacy life, pharmacists, pharmaceutical reps. That was the glam job in the 80s as a sales guy, right? Yep. I can't wait to be a pharmaceutical sales rep. But I could, so I went through all the on campus interviews and things like that. And I just couldn't, I couldn't crack it because I didn't have any, there was no sales experience, right? Wow. So. My dad and all his infinite wisdom says, dude, he goes, you're getting married a couple months later. This is after I graduated. He goes, you got to have a job. Yep. And that was just one of the things you got to find a job. You got to start your career and you got to start moving forward. And I had no idea what I wanted to do because I was getting pissed off. I couldn't get a job as a pharmaceutical rep. But my dad traveled a lot and he goes, hey, I was on an airplane and I sat next to this guy who worked for a big copier manufacturer and all that. And he just flew around and all that. And he goes... Tell your son that if he can sell copiers for a year and last, then he's worth his weight in gold out there in the sales world because people like to hire copier reps. Interesting. So I said, okay, cool. So I opened up. So now I'm dating myself. I opened up the yellow pages. Yep. And I found the ad with the biggest yellow pages, you know, the biggest thing of the copier. I called up. I asked for the owner of the company, got an interview with the owner of the company. And a week later, I got hired. And that was my first job, and it was the it was the worst experience I ever. Was had. it hard, by the way, <clears throat> when you cold called that guy? Did he like start beating you up on that call? Like, how did that go? No, that I, I just, I just, all I did is I just, you know, I, I just asked for the owner of the company. I didn't even know who the dude's name was. Got it was it. This yellow page ad and a phone number. I just said, hey, I just graduated college, and you know, I was living in the hellhole of all California, which is Bakersfield, California, which is the armpit of California. Oh wow. And uh, I can say it because I live there. But <laughs> so all I did is I just asked for the owner. I said, hey, I'm a recent college grad, right? I'm getting married in February and I'm hoping you can help me out. I need a job. And that was it. Wow. And so I got, I got hired a week later and it was the worst experience of my whole entire life. I made $18,000 my first year selling copiers, which, you know, is nothing. I mean, I, I had commission checks larger than that later on, but To the point is I stuck through it because I remember my dad saying, you find a job and you start your career. And that's what is embedded in my brain. And I said, you know what, regardless, you know, today people job hop, like we sneeze. All the time. All the time. And I just said, you know what, I got to stick through it. And I just got to learn the craft. And one of the things that I did, and in fact, I just got the phone with somebody right before you and I were speaking and he goes, what was your secret sauce in this? And I said, besides my heart is I went and I found out everybody who I was losing to as a salesperson and I befriended every salesperson that beat the shit out of me selling copiers. Oh, and wow. I, and I asked them what they were doing and they started helping me, believe it or not. And they were competitors. It's awesome. They, and it's just because I think the whole key in selling from the heart is you got to be vulnerable and you got to ask for help. Yeah. And not, and you know, I don't care if you're a male or a female, you got pride and there's not too many people that are going to roll it up and get vulnerable. And I grew up, you know, with all sisters and most of my cousins were girls. So I grew up in an environment that was just female ridden. So I always tell people I'm a, you know, 
even though I'm a male, I got a lot of female tendencies in me, but that's okay. But I found out that came to play in sales. It was that mother is that motherly instinct. Right. And so, you know, I grew up in a Jewish household with a Jewish mom and Jewish grandparents and all that. So it's like, they're always asking what you're doing and things like that. <laughs> you feel guilty for everything. So I had a lot of that built up inside me as a salesperson. So I said, okay, I'm going to bring the heart to sales. I'm going to bring awesome. Jewish guilt to sales. So I guilted myself over everything, you yep. know, and all I wanted to do was see, cause I grew up in an industry that is just got a black eye that's backwards. It's laggard, you know, it's prehistoric and things that's like that. It's a tough industry. That's a tough it's industry. Bru- it, Brandon is brutal. But what I did is as I started interviewing salespeople, I started interviewing my customers and I started interviewing prospects and just people, people who know me real well go, I'm just, I'll just randomly start asking questions out of right field that they'll never suspect will come out of a salesperson's mouth. And I started asking executives, office managers, facility, everybody that I came across selling copiers, what is it that you like and don't like about salespeople? That's a great question. And I just start, and I always carry, and I'm, you know, I'm what did you old. hear? Was tell me like, what did you hear is the top ones that they didn't like? And then what were the top things that they did like? Didn't like broken promises, being lied to. They don't take care of me. They come and go. They only come around when they want to sell me something. Mm-hmm. Those are the common ones. And they're still common to this day. Did they hate the like aggressive salespeople or yes. that didn't really come up a lot? No, it, 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 it did, but you know, what's, what came up the most is I'll call it Johnny come lately, right? They come around, they're your best. Johnny friend. come lately. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. Johnny but, come lately. <laughs> but they, they come around only when they want to sell something. Okay. Right. Because it's all about, it's all about them. It's never about the customer. Yeah. Like you got a month till quota, you know, and it right now there's 23 sales days left in the year. We're doing this interview. Right. So I hit you up, you know, Johnny come lately, you know, what do you need? What can, what can so, I want? So that's all I did. So, you know, so this is me. So here, so here we go. Right. I carry these around everywhere. These little yellow pads. Yeah. I, I got, got this little book. I, I got them in my car. I got notebooks in my car. I carry a man bag, right? A little sports bag. I got paper in that. Oh, dude, and, I got a man bag here. I'll show you my, my man bag is actually pretty tight. I'd be curious to see your man bag. No, mine's a dude. Mine's a sports bag. You're 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 a lot more professional than I am, dude. No way, dude. I I got this. We I get everyone here a man bag. Uh, oh, dude, I, I I love it. It it's it it's so funny. So I went to I went to Starbucks last Sunday. Yeah. Every Sunday I'll go to I you know I had to wean myself off of Starbucks. So I only go on Sundays now. I'm still addicted, dude. I I got it. Right. So I, I went I went to Starbucks and I drop my man bag on the counter and I'm looking for change. And the dude's just freaking laughing at me. He goes, oh, man. How big is your man bag? Is this like a my man bag? I'm digging through it. And I go, I'm pulling out my wallet and I'm pulling out pens and I'm pulling out a rubber band. I go, I bet you, I bet you, you see women do this. You don't see too many guys pulling out stuff out of their man bags. Dude, you know, they got an iPhone app, right? Bro. Like you just <laughs> hit the iPhone app button and pay. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but you know, but but getting but but getting back to that is I care I carried this with me all the time as a salesperson and I just started asking people questions, right? Yeah. What do you like and don't like? And what they like most about the, the stuff that they liked. <laughs> that people cared, that they came around, that they showed interest, Got that it. you know, that they cared they cared about me even after the sale. And so that that was my big strength is to me, you know, I, I think the whole the whole key to sales is the art of the help is if you're not willing to help somebody, then get out of sales, right? Right. Just completely get out of sales. And, and it's so funny because when I work with sales teams, I ask them one question all the time. Why are you in this business? And what was really cool is I went back, I'm coaching, I'm coaching my sales team. I'm coaching a sales team right now of a company I worked for for 20 years. So it's kind of cool that, I'm actually, they're actually paying me to train the salespeople that I used to work with. That's awesome. And, and one of the questions I, cause I have this whole thing about providing value and I'm really big into value. 
Yeah, me too. You gotta understand your value, right? There's too many people. See, there's too many people that that walk around saying they're authentic, they're, they're the real deal, they're a trusted advisor. I want to be your partner. You know, I think if you're saying that, that, you're not you're not anything. If you're, you say you're, you're a thought anything. leader, are you a thought leader, or do you like you demanding that? Like, okay, shit. So, so so here you go, Brandon. This this and I always tell salespeople this. I said you gotta be aware of the question that's going to come out of right field from an executive. And this is the question. And I role play with salespeople all the time on this yeah. is imagine this, right? Cause you all have a targeted list of accounts. Yep. Hopefully, you know, you got your top five, right? You got your top five dream corporations you want to do yeah. business with, whether they're you better have a list, you better right? have whether they're list. upper tier, mid tier, lower tier on it based on your marketplace. I really don't care, but you got to have your top five dream clients that you want to do business with. I said, let's just say that Brandon is the number one dude that you've been trying to do business with at ABC company for the last couple of years. And finally, by some miracle, right? You got that appointment with Brandon and Brandon's his savvy executive and so yep. forth. And then you got to be able to answer this question. And here's the question. I'm, I'm writing it down. I want to hear it. And, and, the, and I go, you got to be prepared to answer this. If that person greets you, right? Mm -hmm. They welcome you into your office and Brandon says, hey, Larry, right? I'm so glad. I, I've been waiting to see you. I, you're You've been diligent. You've been persistent. I wish my salespeople were like this. But before we get going, so the executive takes control of the call, and he goes, before we get going, because I'm curious what you have to say and how you can help me, but what's the value? What value can you bring to my organization to help me do better business? And then I stop. If salespeople can't answer that, they're fucking dead in the water. Yep. So, and that's, that's the key is there's, there's very few salespeople that understand the true value they bring to their clients because it's perceived value. Because if you ever ask salespeople, ask salespeople, especially their top five clients, ask them how great of a relationship do you have with your top five clients? They're going to go rock solid, man. We're, we're partners. We're buddies, right? We're like that. And I said, well, great. Why don't you give me the phone number to Brandon so I can call Brandon right now and I'll let me ask him how tight you guys are. Nice. Yeah, right? I love that. I love that. And I mean, um, so this, it, it sounds like the sales secret from, from your point of view is basically what you wrote about selling from the heart. You got to sell from the heart. Is that the sales secret? And you have to be authentic and authenticity sells. Is that how you would sum that up? Well, it, it Authenticity sells, but you got to understand what authenticity means. Okay. What is it? Uh, to, me, it it's really, it, to, to me, it's really simple. And, and I, I mean, I don't even know. It's you got to walk, talk, act, live, breathe, sleep, being a real normal human being that actually gives a rip about people. And I always say you got to give a rip about yourself, your career, your employer, your clients, and your prospects. No, I mean, I talk about this every day, live, like, 50 times because I think it needs to be drilled into our team every second of every day. But, 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 but here's the thing is most people don't give a rip about their clients that they might think about them. Right, Brandon, but do you actually give a rip? And, and, and I'll, I'll give you an example of this. So it, I think it's difficult to do this with every single client. I mean, you have to really tear your clients out and you got to yeah. take, you know, your, your tier one, your tier two, your tier three clients and your tier one clients. I mean, you better well know they're married. They got kids, boyfriends, girlfriends. You got to know everything about them. Yeah. And, so, and so what I did, and, and I, this, this worked for me. It doesn't, it may not, people think I'm crazy is my top 25 clients I saw every single month. Now in my marketplace, I was even, I just calendared it out, right? Maybe if you're virtual, it's hard, but still you could see your clients virtually every single month, just like Easily, I'm looking at you dude. via Zoom. No, there's no excuse yeah, why jump you can't on FaceTime in two seconds you're live with someone, a second. Exactly, but what I did, so Grant, you know, I, I told you I grew up in the office technology space, is every single month, come hell or high water, I was in their office. 
awesome. I was walking the halls of their building. I was shaking people's hands. I was making sure things were working all right. Me personally in a freaking suit because I wore a suit every day. I was cleaning copiers, right? I had a rag and all that. I was going above and beyond. I would make sure I stopped by people's offices. Hey, Brandon, how's it going? That's all I had to do, right? If I saw that there was paper clips laying on the floor or something like that around the copier, I pick them all up. To me, that's just be that's just being normal. That's normal right. for me. But yeah. what happens is people go, you know what? Larry's the real deal, and they start telling people. Let me sh let me share the experience I had with Larry. And they start telling people, and I always say, you know what? As a salesperson, your biggest job is to is to provide them an experience they'll never forget. But it's those experiences that they'll go out and tell other people. So they'll tell you great experiences and they'll tell you shitty experiences. Yeah. But can your, can you, the people you're doing business with, can they tell you the Larry Levine story? Can they tell you the Brandon story? And the only way your clients can tell your story is you got to care so much about them that you're building a relationship that you, I mean, they knew it, it was so funny because when I'd go out with my VP of sales, I'd go out to my top tiered accounts and I'd hug them, right? You give them a guy hug, you give them a lady hug, whatever, you high five them. I would swear in front of them and things like that. He goes out and he goes, I can't believe you do that. And I go, that's when you're tight is when you can do that, you know, you're in, but there's not that many salespeople that do that because they think it's too touchy feely. And that's what we've lost as salespeople. We've lost the authenticity, the emotional part of this because, and, and I, I blog about it, I put it in my book, I podcast about it, is most salespeople look at their clients with dollar signs. They look in their eyes and they see dollar signs. And that's why I always say, if you lead with your wallet first, they're going to smell you a mile away. So I always say, you got to lead with your heart because it'll fill up your wallet. Yeah. And most people, don't, most people don't realize that. Yeah, dude. That if, if you're vulnerable, you're transparent. Why do you think Southwest Airlines, people love that because it's transparency, right? It's that whole play on transparency. They call it transparency. So if you're as transparent as transparent gets and you can have a heartfelt conversation from, from a salesperson to an executive, they're going to go, holy shit, I wish my salespeople would do that. But in order to do that, you got to get vulnerable. And I don't know how many people will get vulnerable with themselves. Yeah. No, that, you know that's I mean? great advice. And, and would you say, you know, I, I personally noticed this and I, I actually don't talk about it a lot. Um, but I remember when I used to lead with my wallet, you know, when I first got into sales, cause you're young, you, you don't know what you're doing. And then the minute I transitioned from like, you, you, I, I, I believe you have to believe in the product that you're selling, like hands down, like you can't sell snake oil to someone if you don't believe in it. Like, I think you got to like live and breathe the product that yeah. you sell. But so you can't be authentic without believing in the product that you sell. And then once you know that you've got the best product for that, these customers, you know, I, I changed my mindset. I was like, I knew, like I, I sold a, a Google search marketing for Google okay. and IBM. So when I was selling for Google with my partner currently, Jake and a few others, uh, who's now my partner at Seamless.ai, I literally believed like if I went into that room and they went with another Google search marketing company, like they may lose their house. They may not be able to pay, put food on the table. They may not be able to pay for the mortgage. They may get fired. The company may go out of business and now a thousand people are on the streets. Yeah. And like, my, and I also remember doing it for my team. Like, okay, if I could, if I could bring in this deal for like, it's going to help Jake pay for his kid's private school that he can't afford because he's got four kids. And I know if I do that, this is going to provide for them. It's going to provide for my customer. And I just took, I didn't give a shit about my commissions anymore. And that was the, that, that year when I did that was the wealthiest I've ever been. It was the first year I got my first six figure commission check in one month and became a millionaire because of that, that authenticity and that care and that do whatever it takes to make sure that I help my customer and my team be successful and, and fucking believe that shit. Yeah. So, so, but now, and, and that, I love that stuff, but, but here's something I want people to think about is how many are willing to walk away when they know it's not right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was just on a call literally before this, and it it was a seven figure deal. So literally, like you scoped out multi seven figure deal, and we brought the deal down to over six figures because we wanted them to do it in segments, smaller yeah. segments. You know, so we deliver the world's best sales leads. They wanted to buy a lot, like millions of sales leads, and we're like, look, let's bring this thing down much smaller. And we want to te- you to test and optimize your total addressable market so that you're not wasting budget. And dude, it's tough. I even said on the call, I was like, my VP of sales right now is going to fucking kill me. You yeah. Know? But, but I was like, but this is what we believe. Like, I don't think you should buy your TAM when you don't even have enough salespeople to sell the one tenth of your TAM right now. Yeah. And you know, my investors don't want to probably hear that. My VP of sales may not want to hear that. But at the end of the day, they're going to crush this campaign. And then it's going to turn into a 10, 20, $30 million deal. And, and, and see, that, that's what people don't understand is this, this whole authenticity and doing what's right for your client or your prospect, which may mean, you know what? I might not be the right fit or it might not be the right time. And if it's not the right time, then let's agree on my, maybe when the right time is. But I always say pipeline never lies, right? And that's, the, and that's the problem is, you know, weak pipeline has salespeople doing things they normally wouldn't do if their pipeline was Desperation, full. desperation. Right? And, 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 people, and people smell it, right? It's the day before the end of the month right now. Yeah. So, I mean, you know what's happening across sales teams all over the place right now. And you know what's going to happen. 23 sales days left. Yeah. And you know what's going to happen next month. In fact, I got an email from somebody yesterday. And he <laughs> goes, I have to put off our call for Friday tomorrow because we had an open house yesterday. It's a couple days before the end of the month. And we got the holidays coming up. And my reply back in an email was one word. Excuse. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's, it is an excuse. It's bullshit. It's an ex- it's an excuse, right? Yep. So just just make it a priority. I hate excuses. I hate trying to. I'm going to try. Like but, but, no you know, but, but, but you know, getting back getting back to this whole heart thing. Yeah, heart- how do you do it, man? How do you do it? Like I'm new to sales, or I've been selling. You know, everyone. So our audience that's watching this right now, that's reading the book, Larry Levine, the author of Selling from the Heart. Your sales secret is to sell from the heart. You know, what, how the hell do I do that if I've been in this state of like desperation? If I'm not used to that, like where do I even start to, to, to try to implement this? You know, you know, okay, so, so here's, a great, here's a great example. And, and I write about in the first three chapters, three and a half chapters of selling from the heart. It all starts here first. You got to work on your core. And that's what I share with people all the time. You want to start learning how to sell from the heart. You got to, and I know you do this, is you got to self-reflect every single day, right? And I know you get up at dark 30 in the morning. I get up at 3.30 in the morning every single day. Damn, dude. I don't get up. I get up like 4.30. You get up at 3.30. Th- I've never met someone that gets up at 3.30 yeah. every day. So, uh, what, my, what do you do at 3.30? What do you do at 3.30? So I'll tell you, my alarm, my alarm, but this, I'll tell you how they So get aggressive. Started. So I thought I'll, I'll tell you, this is how you can start selling from the heart. So anyway, so I learned a long time ago that my brain worked best early in the morning. Some people's brains work better at night or late in the afternoon. My, my brain, morning, I found out that my brain worked the best. I was like in the mode early in the morning. Yep. And then, thing. and I like going to the gym just like you do. So yeah. I learned that if I can go to the gym early in the morning, then I can start off my day. Well, now, you know, uh, I mean, obviously I work from home now, so it makes it a lot easier, but I set my alarm for four and I don't even need to, I, I can't remember the last time an alarm's ever woken me up. About 3.15 in the morning, I start, I've, I mentally trained my brain that unless I've tipped one the night before, then I usually will get up around 3.15. Yep. But, and then about 3.30, I'll roll out. And from 3.30 to 4 o'clock, I sit in this office with a, just a little tiny light on, not a real bright light, like a night light. And I just sit there in complete silence and I just think about everything that I need to do. I self-reflect. I mentally start preparing myself for the day. What I do yesterday, what could I do better today? So that's like, you kind of like, do like a meditation type of thing? 
No, no. Gee, I, I sit in a freaking chair right behind me, right, with a blanket, and I just sit there and I just veg and I just start thinking, right? Thinking about what went well yesterday, what yeah. can improve, what and then that, and that and that and that's all I do. And 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 I go, okay, if I if I fucked around the day before because whatever, then I beat myself up for it. And yeah. then literally at four o'clock, a little bit after, I'm in the gym and I just sit there and I do cardio for one straight hour, awesome. and that's all I do. And then, and that cardio just allows me to start thinking and I kind of just program my brain. It works for me. I've yeah. never overcomplicated anything because I told you my dad was a rocket scientist and complicated the shit out of everything. Yeah. I just made it work for me. So I do a lot of self-reflection. I do a lot of self-awareness. I beat myself up and I'm probably my own worst enemy for it, but it's yeah. made who I am. And I think that's, and that's why I wrote the first three chapters of my book, three and a half chapters about just getting brutally honest with yourself is if you want to become a better salesperson and learn how to sell from the heart, then it all starts with what's inside here. And the only way that works is you got to work on your core and I'll, and I'll use a great example. And, and I was sharing this with Mike Weinberg Yep. and um, I said, listen, when you're, so the, the best example, this is where I really got it was um, my back was out of wax. I flew a lot this year and I, was, I sit a lot and, and all that. My back was really hurt. And finally I caved in, I completely caved in and I went to an orthopedic doctor the end of August. They took x-rays in my back and all that. Oh, well, and they go, sorry to hear that. no, it's not, they go, you don't have a hurt, but, but, he, but here's where selling from the heart comes into play. They go, you don't have a herniated disc or anything like that. I want you to do physical therapy for the month of September at the end of September, actually come in here October 1st. And if it's not better, you'll get an MRI and do all this stuff. So I go fine. So I had to go for physical therapy three times a week for the whole month of September. And I got to my second session. And right before I started my second session, the guy who's doing PT with me goes, hey, Larry, what do you want to accomplish at the end of this that you're not doing right now? And I said, I want to get back to lifting some light weights where my back's not hurting because all I'm doing right now is straight cardio and stretching. And he goes, okay, fine. This is what you're going to have to start working on, your core. You're, you know, you, you do core work, right? You got to yeah. just bring down your chest, flare out your sides, tighten your stomach muscles and things like that. Yeah. So I started doing that and all of a sudden I started having great workouts. And after five minutes, I'm just dripping down sweat and things like that. The third visit, I started doing it. I awesome. dropped the cable weights and I go, I got it. And the guy looks at me and he goes, you got what? And I go, dude, sorry. I was thinking about sales while I'm doing this. I go, <laughs> my, I go, my core's out of whack. So my back was hurting. My core's out of whack. I'm in a bad mood. My back hurts. I'm not eating right, right? Because my back yeah. hurts always bitching and moaning my core's out of whack and I go that's selling from the heart and I told Mike Weinberg that and he goes you're, he goes you're onto something and he goes what do you mean and I go li and he, he asked he goes what do you mean I go listen if your core's out of whack as a salesperson nothing else matters if you got a bad personal life if you're not eating right you're not doing all these things you're never going to succeed in sales and the thing and the thing that we do in sales is we work on everything else but ourselves we work on everything else. We work on product knowledge, solutions knowledge, handling objections, assessing a client, doing whatever, but we don't work on ourselves. Nobody has us working on ourselves. Yeah. And if you can work on yourselves and you can align yourself, your mind and your values and you latch all that together, then watch what starts to happen. Yeah. But, 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 nobody, but nobody's doing that. And it's not that hard. And everyone goes, oh, that's too touchy-feely. Nah, fuck that. You can't have, you can't maximize your wealth if you don't have the right health and the right mindset. And, and I mean, and, and that, and that, and that's the core right here. So, so, it, and it, here's a, here's a great analogy I always use. I said, you bring your heart to your family. At least I sure hope you do. Right. Yeah. I, I don't care. You know, you got a fiance. So, yeah. you know, and I, and I've been happily married for 26 years and I go, Congrats. love okay. it. And you know, there's been this just like, just like everything else. Yep. But, but here's what I want salespeople to realize, and they all have families, you all have siblings, you all have a spouse or a significant other or something like that. You would never treat them like shit. At least I hope you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. You're going to bring your heart to your family. You're going to care. You're going to give a rip about your family because that's you provide for. So if that's what you'll do with your family, why can't you do that with your clients and your prospects and your job? And yeah. that's the, that's the missing link. And I go, you know, 
again, I'm not Dr. Phil by no means, but can you imagine the div- what the divorce rate would be if people actually give a shit about each other and actually led with their heart? What would start to happen? And I always say, you know, you're just one experience away from being displaced in your client's office. You just don't know it yet because you're not leading with your heart. And if you can actually give a rip about your clients and actually care and have their best interests at heart and tug on their heartstrings, watch what starts to happen to that level of relationship. Wow. But the, the only thing is, is most people don't do that because it's not ingrained at the top of the company. And that's, that's, that's the biggest thing where it starts is I always tell business owners of companies, I said, you know what the key to your success is just live your mission statement. Right. You have a mission statement, you have a value statement, you got a vision statement and it's customer first is customer centric. If you gave me your top 10 clients right now and you ask me survey them and ask them how customer centric and focused you are, would you really want to know? Just act upon, just do what you say you're going to do. And that's half the battle. Yeah. Damn. So, so for salespeople that are, are listening and watching and reading, you know, the first step to, to, to start selling from the heart would be to. You got to believe it. You got yeah, like, to internal, yeah, internalize it. it. You, you got to really get to know who you are. And if you can't do that, dude, get out of sales. You might have, I mean, you could have some success in it, but it, it, unless you really, really internalize what it really means to care, they get out of sales, just totally get out of sales. And, and that's why, you know, that's why industry pundits and consultants and people who write beat the shit out of salespeople because you give them a reason why. Yep. No. And, I, and, I said, and I said, that's, you know, I, I always said, I, you know, I'm not the smartest whip out there. Mm -hmm. But I've made actually caring about somebody that I'm trying to sell something to first and foremost, because unless you care, nothing's ever going to happen. And it's not that hard. It's really not that hard. This was definitely one of the the biggest game changers that I applied to my sales career was selling from the heart, caring about the customer for sure. Because they could do, they can sense it, right? What do you do? And here's a good question because this ha- happens a lot and it happened to me before and it's why I left my, my one, like, what do you do if you're selling something that you do not believe is the best interest or the best product for the, com- for the customer? So let's just Go say you're it. selling a copier, right? Because that's where you come from and you don't believe it's the best and you don't like it, but you need to provide for your family. Like, what do you do? How do you sell from the heart in that situation? I- Dude, I've, I've pissed, I've pissed a bunch of sales managers off in my day because I walk away. If I, if I know in my heart that, you know, this is just not going to work, I walk away. I, I literally will walk away from the deal. So are you recommending like, Hey, if like, like we'll use cars because I know cars a little bit more than copiers. Like if I love Mercedes, like we'll die for Mercedes and I'm selling a Volkswagen or I'm selling a Toyota and I, I don't, I, I hate Toyotas. Are you, are you recommending that the salesperson like get out of the Toyota and go try to sell for Mercedes? Like how do you sell from the heart if like you don't believe in the product? You can't. There's, there, I mean, you're only deceiving yourself. It'll never work. Yeah. So it, can, gotta, it, it, can, it can, it can never it. work. Yeah. And so I think for salespeople out there, like based on Larry's recommendation, guys, if you're selling something that you don't believe in, that you wouldn't even buy yourself, how can you sell from the heart and be authentic if, if you won't even buy it yourself? Well, no. And, 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 here, and, and here's something to look at. It's like a, like a three-legged stool. And this is the magic moment is you have to, as a salesperson, you got to understand your values. You got to understand your personal values, what you bring to the table. Okay. Set the product aside just for a second. You got to understand your values. You got to understand your company's values and you got to align it with what the client values. And if you can do that, that's a home run. 
but most people can't do that. Right. Right. And, and that's why I, you know what I, and my wife, I mean, if, if my wife was sitting right here in this chair, sitting right next to me, she would tell you cause she's seen it happen. She's I've told her many times I've walked away from sales deals because the deal wasn't right because I knew in my heart. So, you know, I, so I live in thousand Oaks, California. I'll tell you where the fires and the, sh- the mass shootings happened a couple weeks ago. So oh, I live amazing. in a, tight, I live in a tight knit community that I had to sell in. And if I sold something that I didn't believe in that I knew wasn't right for them, I had to face those people out in the community. So why would I, so why would I succumb myself to that? Right. Yep. And, and even if I know that meant that I didn't hit quota for the month or I didn't make as much money as I wanted to make, then so be it. Right. But that comes around 10 times later. But if, if I sell a product that I don't believe in that I shoehorn into somebody's office, I don't care what it is, right? Set copiers aside. It could just be a widget for all I care. If, if I'm just selling a widget that I know is a piece of shit that I know a year down the road is probably going to take a dump in somebody's office, but I'm, I'm making a sale, dude, that's self-deception 101. And you're never going to be successful at all, period. Your name's just going to be pure turd. Yep. And then how could you ever go back to that customer and expect to sell them something? It's never going to work. Nope. Never. Never in a million years. And, and that, see, that's the first part of selling from the heart is knowing in your heart that if that situation's not right, you got to bail. You just got to bail. And how many people, Brandon, are willing to bail? Probably see, not a lot. Dude, dude, I'm serious. How many people are willing to say, you know what? This isn't for me. Yeah. That's weird because for me, like bringing that deal down, you know, from a seven-figure deal to a six-figure deal, like, we didn't even think about it. I mean, I probably should have thought about it a little bit more, but we, we didn't think about it. We just knew it was right. We knew that doing that type of deal that way, the way that they wanted was going to be wrong, and they would have blown a lot of cash because there's no way you can go after that many leads in the next 60, 30 days effectively. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's smart. Like, Larry, you, like, I completely agree. you got to be able to walk away. you got to believe in what you're doing. If you would do it as the customer, like, you got to believe what you're recommending. If you were the customer and you had to do what they were recommending, that that was the right thing to do. Yeah, so, so, so I mean, it's, it's really simple as this. Would you take a shit on your family? Now, granted, some people would probably take a shit on their family, and that's too bad. But if, if, you, if, you, if you aren't going to take a shit on your family, then why are you going to shit on your clients and your prospects just to make a buck? Right. I just don't get it. But it, it, it's easy because, you know, people, you know, I, I really look at things two different ways. And this is what I work with salespeople on all the time because salespeople like, I, I mean, managers and owner, they love what's in your pipeline, right? What's in your sales funnel? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why I said sales funnel never lies. But if you look inside somebody's sales funnel and it's weak, I'm going to ask you to look at something else. And this is what I manage myself to. And I work with sales teams extensively on this is you got to have something called a relationship funnel. And if you don't have a relationship funnel, and if that relationship funnel is not full of healthy relationships, you're never going to have a full and healthy sales funnel. Now think about that one for a second. Wow. Crazy, dude. Crazy. Because I love most, that. Because most people, you know, so you have a top of, middle of, and bottom of a sales funnel, right? Mm-hmm. So, and you all know that. You, you know funnel management 101. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm preaching to the choir on that one. But if I just meet Brandon for the very first time, that's not, that's not top of sales funnel anything, right? You, I mean, we're getting into the suspect, prospect, right? Yeah, those are our stages too. Suspect, right? prospect, engaged. Right. So, but, but if I just meet Brandon for the first time, it's my, it's my duty as a sales rep to build a relationship with that person. So just now, if I, whether it's through Zoom or whatever, then Brandon's sitting at the top of my relationship funnel. He hasn't even gotten to the sales funnel yet. And that's what I want salespeople to realize. That's when you can walk away from deals is 
if I have, if I have, if I meet a slew of people, they're sitting at the top of my relationship funnel. It's up to me to build that relationship with them and get them through a relationship funnel. Because by the time it gets to a bottom of a relationship funnel, I got to figure out some way of moving that to a sales funnel, which would be the top of a sales funnel. Wow. And that's how, I, that's how I manage myself. If I'm not openly, and I know you do this, if I'm not openly having conversations every single day with people, I'll never have a full sales funnel. But how many salespeople will talk to somebody unless they're wanting to buy something from them? Not many. Yeah. But we all know that the only way to start a sales cycle with somebody is you got to open your mouth and start a conversation. But it may not be right now. So that's what I always say. You can walk away from deals if you know that relationship funnel is nice and full with relationships that are all throughout that relationship funnel. If you can say, you know what, this isn't for me, the timing's not right, or you know what, I want you to go over to ABC company because I think they're right for you. Yeah. That will come back tenfold later, but I also know that I got 100 people sitting in a relationship funnel that I could pull from. That's amazing, man. Yeah, it's funny. We, we, walked, we even walked away from a seven-figure investment offer recently because the venture capital firm wanted us to be not us. They wanted us to be different. They didn't like that we were out there. They didn't like that we were posting every single day what we were doing in sales and in marketing, and they yeah. didn't like our strategy. They didn't like our personality. They didn't like a lot of things about us. And we, you know, My team, I, I told my team, I was like, guys, it was a team, team decision. What do you want to do? Everyone voted it down, and we're like, this could really hurt us but whatever. And then we got double, double the offer from a, a better, more qualified investor that, that's taken us to, to a better place that we need to go that believes in everything we're doing and believes in how authentic we are and how we act and operate and our intelligence and our backgrounds and, you know, well, you know you just, from the heart and authenticity. Man. Yeah, mean, you just, you just reminded, yeah, you just reminded me of something. I was, t I was telling the story to somebody yesterday that I was talking to. I said, listen, if you took my whole entire career, if you took the last 25 years, you know, outside of what I'm doing now, I got to set that aside. But if you took the last 25 years when I was selling copiers in the LA marketplace, if you started taking all my clients and you started putting them in vertical markets, you know, in buckets, you would find that I had... I had a lot in private schools. I had a lot in churches. I had a lot in not-for-profits. I had a lot in, in large companies. And, it was, and people go, well, why'd you do that? And I said, you know what? It aligned to who I was. I do a lot in the community. I'm community-minded. So I always have a heart for not-for-profit organizations. My, my son went to private school, so I understand the whole private school mentality and things like that. It aligned to my mindset. Yep. You know, not, and for some reason, this Jewish guy had a lot of success selling to churches, which I have no freaking clue why. I never mm -hmm. sold to a temple, but I can always sell to churches. Totally hilarious. And, and then I have a high level of business acumen, and I love having business conversations with people, and I love having conversations with executives. And I think if, if salespeople really started to understand who they were and what made them tick and where they're strong and where their values were at and start matching their clients and their prospects to it, watch what starts to happen. But the problem is, is most salespeople are dialing for dollars, nothing wrong with that, but they're dialing for somebody to buy something from them or say, yeah, come, come by. And, and they don't even know if there's any alignment. Why don't you start looking at what are the what are the vertical markets out there? What are the industries that align to the my values? What are the companies that align to my values? Which I might have to do some research and then watch what starts happening at the level of your conversations. You're having normal human conversations with people based on some mutual interest, based on something that says, "Hey, we're here because of some common interest." But you know, I always sell instead of dialing for dollars, dial for a conversation with somebody. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible, man. Well, look, Larry, just because we have to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much, Larry Levine, international best-selling author of Selling from the Heart, co-host of Selling from the Heart podcast, 30 years of the field sales experience within the B2B tech space. He knows what it takes to be successful as a sales professional. Larry, thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of uh, Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, the world's awesome. best thank sales you. experts share their secrets to sales success. We're excited to get this out into the world uh, so everyone in the world can benefit. And where can people find you and buy your book real quick? 
they can they can find all about me on sellingfromtheheart.net. Um, they can buy the book on Amazon right now. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I'm all over LinkedIn, as awesome. with you. Uh, L a r r y l e v i n e. Just yeah. go on LinkedIn and search, and he'll be right up at the top there. And uh, I'm open to talk to anybody. I love having conversation with people, and more importantly, anyone can reach out to me if they ever need any help. And believe me, I will help if I can. If not, I'll find somebody to help you. Amazing. Well, Larry, thank you so much. I got to jump right now to another call, but I appreciate you, man. This was great. Thank you so much. All right, later. Cheers. All right, bye.